welcome to this edition of Talks at Google. I'm Kavya Kasturi Rangan, and I'm beyond excited to welcome you to this fireside chat with Dominique Roque. Dominique is the author of this extremely fascinating, nuanced, and yet very, very evocative account of how the perfume industry works and how it sources its natural ingredients that make up most of the scents. When I think about it, one of my sharpest memories of my grandparents' ancestral home in South India is the smell of jasmine and tulsi, holy basil, that was offered at the altar in the house every day. It's been so many years and the smell still lingers in my memory. While smells are said to evoke nostalgia, I'm excited to talk to Dominique uh, about how something as fleeting and ephemeral as a smell can be captured and bottled, branded, and sent out into the world for all of us to consume. But before we get to chat with Dominique, I did want to really quickly welcome you all as our audience and ask you to post your questions for Dominique in the chat window that appears in the YouTube screen. With that, Hi, Dominique. Welcome to the talk. I am Hello, so Kavya. excited to have you here. I'm delighted to be with you. Likewise, likewise. Thank you so much for writing this book, Dominique. I learned so much about the perfume that I so nonchalantly spray on every morning. It was, it was really, really insightful. So maybe for our audience, let's unpack this a little. Can you Tell us what the journey of a life of a bottle of perfume is. Where does the journey begin and how does it really conclude? Okay, so I'll try to keep this very simple and uh, sorry for people in our audience who may be uh, experts or semi-experts of that, but um, just to keep it uh, simple, a bottle of perfume, first of all, a, a reminder is that it's roughly 85% of alcohol mixed with 15% of what we call uh, a juice, uh, for a lack of a better word, which is what will be, has been created by the perfumers and which gives its, its personality to the perfume. So that's what's in your bottle. Now let's go a little bit further with that. Where do those 15% come from? So here immediately comes uh, something that is generally very well known is that uh, uh, a composition by a perfumer is a combination, a mixture of synthetic ingredients and natural ingredients. That's a lot of debate and a lot of discussions around the merits of, uh, of each category, with very often uh, people being uh, a little bit shocked when they learn that there is or there may be uh, so much synthetic in a perfume that costs a lot of money, right? <laughs> so... Um, so the, the truth is that uh, for a long, long time, uh, perfumes were only natural, and, and it's only about uh, the half of the 19th century that uh, the synthetic molecules were, were beginning to be invented and, and completely changed the game. Let's say to keep, keep that again very simple, that um, perfumers, professional, high-level perfumers, think that they cannot create without the synthetic, but because the synthetic will give some kind of structure, some kind of a, let's say, like, like a skeleton um, to, to their creations. But at the same time, if you go too far and if you create only with synthetics, your perfumes definitely lack something and you can feel it. So that's where the magic of naturals, and I'm saying that because I dedicated my life to, to these <laughs> naturals, that, that's where the, the, the magic comes in. So to, to, to come back to your question, uh, we, we can sort of make a, a very simple drawing of four steps uh, from the field to the bottle of perfume. The first step is really the people in the fields. Like you were mentioning yourself, your memories of Southern India. So you have these, these ladies or, 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 or this uh, gentleman picking uh, the, the, the sambac jasmine, picking the tuberose, picking. So the pickers the farmers really are the, the, the first step of, of the existence of a perfume. And 
usually they are the less known, uh, the people that you don't pay so much attention to, or the people that you don't really know, you know, uh, oh, I didn't know Jasmine was in India, or ah, I didn't know Rose was coming from Bulgaria or Turkey. So the farmers are, are, are the first step. The second step is completely fundamental, is the people we call the producers. It means I'm a farmer growing patchouli leaves in Indonesia, but the perfumer is expecting not patchouli leaves, but a patchouli essential oil. So the, 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 the transformation of the leaves or the flowers into an essential oil or an extract is fundamental because this is where the creation of the perfumer palette happens. Okay, So we have throughout the world in many, many countries the most remote and, and, and some very familiar, because there are a lot of producers of essential oils in the United States, for instance. So throughout the world, we have the, these people. And these people offer to the market bottles, cans, drums of essential oils and various other type of extracts. So that's step two. Step three is the type of company I was working for, which we called FNF, Flavors and Fragrance Houses. Uh, they can be very big. Uh, the, the four majors are two Swiss company, one U.S. company, and one from Germany, uh, and some medium size and a lot of, of smaller ones. These are the people who hire perfumers to really create the products. And who do they create for? They create for the brands. So sometimes they're, they're th these things can be mixed, like some very, very famous brands have their own perfumers. So these last two steps will be just one, you know, like uh, to give an example, Chanel uh, doesn't order its perfumes from an FNF house. It, it has its own perfumers and they, they create themselves. But let's say that the, the structure of the industry is farmers, producers, composers and brands. And we very fascinating. And we literally have only the last quarter that we know of because we're shopping by brands, right? It's exactly. that's the only visible entity. And yet, and yet I wish it wasn't so. So, like, you know, with like gourmet food, for instance, um, there's these days the whole marketing campaign, if you're eating uh, a particular block of cheese, they sort of tell you exactly which cows it came from and from which region and what the diet of the cows was, right? Do you think um, there would ever be a time in the perfume industry where uh, we would get to know who the, the growers were and who the producers were, who the actual scent innovation genius is, and then, of course, the brand that I'm shopping with, right? So do you think that would ever happen, Dominique? We've, we've come a long way. Many things have changed. The truth is that for centuries, uh, perfumery was all about secrecy. <laughs> secrecy of the of the formula and secrecy of the sources and uh, and the french would have a high and strong responsibility in that because for a long time and probably a lot of you have heard the name of grasse the city of, on, on the french riviera that for a long long time at least from the 17th 18th century uh, was really the center of of the world perfumery and these people were so successful and growing so fast that the last thing they wanted is people to know where their famous ingredients were, were coming from. So they were really hiding everything. And hiding meant a lot of things. It meant that, well, you know, the users didn't know. But also, let's face it, you know, it allowed for a lot of uh, bad behaviors and abuse of really exploiting communities uh, at source. And there's an explanation to that. It's because the, the sort of golden age of perfumery, which runs basically from the end of the 19th century to the 30s, uh, that really corresponded to uh, the extension of the European empires, the British Empire, the French Empire, which opened completely new territories for these perfumery people to grow more fields in more uh, more possibilities. So this, this, this very strong heritage was all about obscurity. And what happened now, to, to come back to your point, when I say we come a long way, it's because there's a, a, such a difference now of the, the consumer awareness, you know, 
that this is not possible anymore. So it's really, and you have to understand that it's pretty fascinating. It's the consumer pressure who really pushed the brands first and then our companies and then the producers to say exactly what they were doing, which means that today it's very easy, really, honestly, it's very easy to know if uh, the jasmine is mentioned on, on your bottle of perfume, you can ask and you should get the answer rather easily. Is my jasmine from India or from Egypt? If it's from India, then if you're a consumer, it's not so easy. But if you're inside the industry, of course, you will want to know which Indian producer has crafted your jasmine absolute. And this producer is more and more under a lot of focus and attention from a lot of auditors to know how he behaves and what kind of wages he pays to the women picker. And this is, this is a little silent revolution, really, because the truth is, this has not been going for more than 15 years, these changes. But it's but it's so welcomed, right? It's sort of like a renaissance for the perfume industry, and I'm glad. It's I think it's it's completely vital for them. If they want to survive, they have to do that. Because you know, people very legitimately they say, okay, you tell me uh vanilla in a perfume is fantastic, but I just saw on TV the other day this these things about Madagascar and how the children live there and what's happening and, and this and that. And I want to make sure I'm not part of this ugly game. You know, Very, very true. So the whole sustainability and, and making sure that as consumers, we're not uh, prop in any way further promoting exploitative behavior, right? So I completely, and, and I definitely want to ask you about that, but but I guess my, my question is to, to the initial part of what you were saying about how the methods um, that were the, the perfume industry is sort of almost um, is is almost still a, a relic of how it was being done in the early in the early days of the industry, right? Is that is that that secrecy and that uh, the whole um, mystique of it is that only limited to the whole sourcing piece of it, uh, Dominique, or is that even how even till date uh, as a sourcer? Do you find that the that the flowers are being picked the same way and the essential oil is being uh, is being distilled the same way, or has there been some modernization and some industrialization that has happened there? It's a very very traditional uh, trade, very traditional. Basically, you can you can figure out that uh, a large part of of the palette is is composed of essential oils. So essential oils exist. <laughs> since the end of the of the 17th century uh, and and it's pretty much the same way today as it was then you can even find countries where uh, rose oil is distilled in the same type of steels as it was uh, like i know you're familiar of kanoj in india and all those things so tradition is very 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 strong which is also, let's face it, it's pretty fantastic because that's what I'm trying to tell in my book. You, when, when you go to these countries and you see these old techniques that haven't changed, you wonder, you say that this is pretty magical. It means that the, the tapestry of, of, of these smells, of these scents that have started to be woven uh, centuries ago is still going on. And this is some kind of miracle. So the techniques have not changed except the 19th century brought, besides the essential oils, what we call extracts and absolutes, which means that you use the power of a solvent to extract the scent of a flower instead of the steam, and you extract something different and you extract more. The, the, the whole steam distillation piece that you were talking about was so insightful and I could almost imagine the, the setting and, uh, and given that a, a lot of the uh, natural ingredients that you were talking about were from India, in my head I could, I could totally picture it, right? So it was, it, it's very fascinating and it's, it's, it's actually ironical as well in a way because at, at one end of it, it's so traditional and it's so old school. But the bottle of perfume is so modern and so um, so chic, right? So it's almost at, at complete dissonance with each other. So this is usually when someone says that 
then steps in the perfumer, the, the nez, as we say in French, and he's supposed to be the magician. So he's got, he's used, you know, like uh, a few hundreds of ingredients. We, uh, I tend to think that uh, his palette is based on basically 150 different botanicals, you know, rose being one, we mentioned jasmine, there's many more, but there's not thousands, 150, and that has not changed much. And what does he do? He's going to take this, this palette, all this palette of synthetics, and he starts playing and combining. And amazingly, and amazingly, centuries go by and the creations always bring something new and they're always different. So you can imagine maybe he's, he has, in synthetics, there's a lot of ingredients available, like maybe almost 1,000, okay? And, and he's probably got 300 different natural ingredients. So the combination are limitless. And 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 is that uh, is that how it happened? Uh, is that how it happens even now, Dominique? Or or are there uh, opportunities for new scents to be discovered? Like oh, nobody even knew that there is another kind of vanilla, right? Has that ever happened, or is it all the same? No, no. So you have to realize that the perfumer, of course, they they, they would come to me every day saying, What's "What new? have you got that is new?" <laughs> you know, stop stop telling me that the, the the rose oil crop in bulgaria was good or was bad have you a different rose so different what what would it mean it would mean a different botanical species or yes. it could be a different uh, origin you know a rose from morocco does not smell the sale as a rose from bulgaria. bulgaria and you can multiply the examples so there's a lot uh, if you follow the history and, and the geography of this, it's fascinating. You know, uh, rose is probably one of the most travel um, ingredients, but also, you know, uh, uh, if, if you talk about the, the woods and, and, and what, uh, what is taken from the woods, you have several sources of frankincense, you have several sources of uh, wood, aga wood. Um, and so just by the origin or by a slight difference in a tree species, or, or, or for example, the, the jasmine is a very in interesting example. Jasmine was comes from the north of India. Uh, the Arab merchants uh, really carried it, and it traveled all around the Mediterranean. It stopped in France, in Italy, in Spain. Then it went to Morocco, Egypt, and 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 finally uh, came back to India. But that's one type of jasmine. The, what we call the Big flowers, jasmine, jasmine grandiflorum. Now, when the when the the, the, the perfume people um, got to India in, in in the 70s, with the, because they were sure that to craft their jasmine there would be cheaper, would be cheaper. They suddenly realized that the jasmine people had been had been using another type of jasmine for ever, forever, which was the the sambac, mali mali. mali. Uh, and 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 so they they had no clue. So they started rushing on this new sambac, extracting it, and all of a sudden there was a new jasmine on in their palette. And that happened in, in the 70s, not too long ago. And we have many, many examples like that. So 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 I like what you're saying. So you're saying it's not uh, it's not net new. So it's not as though we go out and we discover something completely unknown, but it's variants of or a different country of where it's grown, which results in sort of differences, right? That that's Yeah, I'm, I'm not saying that you never will discover or have discovered something new, but uh, when you study this a little closer, it's fascinating the amount of energy and research that have been put in the, in the 19th century to try everything everywhere. <laughs> the people were, were so hungry to de discover new territories in Africa, in Asia, that everywhere they went, they were botanists, there were a lot of experts, they were trying absolutely everything. And at, at some point, uh, the, the palette of naturals at the end of the 19th century was richer than it is today, because they were, uh, they were really trying and trying and trying. And then gradually, the perfumer said, well, listen, we, we, we're going to drop that because it's it's not different enough from something else. Because really, the the ultimate game is that the merit of an ingredient has to prove its strength and power in the composition, how it combines with the others. So it can be 
very nice smell by itself, but not be so powerful once mixed with the others. Yep. Yep, it's like it's like um, the role of like a little bit of pepper, very good. But imagine a dish made like ninety percent pepper, right? <laughs> not not so great. Yeah, I I get it. But but actually, that does lead me to another question, which is, if the if the ingredients are a, are a finite set, they're a limited set of ingredients, then um, with the challenges in like climate, uh, with the challenges of deforestation, soil degradation, right? Um, how does the perfume industry view the problem right it's it, it is a problem i guess yes i think um it, it's a concern that really meets uh greater concerns about the the, the planet in general you know you just a, a very small game in a in a much bigger ball game but uh you're right i would say what, what are the main concerns of the industry i would say um in, in terms of climate change it's really water Water is the issue. Um, a lot, most of, of these ingredients cannot grow, will not survive without water. And in countries where climate was very stable, uh, take Western Europe, uh, take Bulgaria, if we take the example of the rose once again, uh, things have started to change, to change drastically. And again, in the past five years, you know, and I, I, I have this example of a, a, a product that is very important and very dear to France, which is lavender, lavender and lavendin. This used to grow wild. You, you, you never cared about anything about the climate because the rains always came at the same season, pretty much the same. And then the lavender bloomed and everything was fine. And all of a sudden, everything changes. Drought comes. The rains are too heavy. They're too late. They're too early. And... The consequence of that is that for most of the flowers, we understand as an industry that it will only survive if we are able to do drip irrigation for the, the future fields. And, and everywhere, the farmers and the producers are converting their, their field to that, which is a big investment, which brings in another very important topic, which is extremely dear to me, which is how should the industry consider the value of these ingredients? Because, okay, you can do drip irrigation. It costs you something. So you go to your your, your, your FNF house and you say, well, I'm sorry, you know, my, my rose oil used to cost $5,000 a kilo, but I will have to raise it to 7000 And there, it's business again. So, you know, you can have the best explanations in the world and you can talk about the the wages of, of, of the Roma people, community pickers, uh, you will bump into a, a, a pretty tough wall. So I'm, I, I've really been uh, fighting a lot to explain the industry that they must realize it's urgent, that the magic and the beauty of these natural ingredients is such that they should be qualified as luxury and not this world should not be used only for the bottle and for the finished product. If a perfume is, is absolutely beautiful, you love it, you're, you, you're really uh, addicted to it, it's because the jasmine absolute that is inside is also magical, is also magical. And, and I'm, I'm taking the jasmine, but some ingredients are even, you know, more mysterious and more incredible, like, like the frankincense, the most ancient ones, you know. Very true. Very, very true. And I think what you said is so true that we, we think of the end product as being luxury goods, but, um, but the, the origin of it, which is the poor flower or the bark or the leaf is not really being thought of in that sense. Right. And, and I guess, it's not being thought of in that sense also because synthetic uh, synthetic equivalence uh, and and the innovation with like kind of finding synthetic equivalence is happening pretty quickly right so you said this in the beginning where you said um, but there's still something missing when it's when it's all synthetic right and 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 i think i would agree with you completely and that's not just with perfumes with food with with makeup right you can tell when something is synthetic versus when something is natural but but is the is the is the industry um i is that the direction that the industry is going to take uh in that like do you think that there will be two categories of perfumes in the future where it will be the natural 
uh, infused perfumes, which would be very expensive, and then more synthetic perfumes. And so those are more affordable. It's complicated. I think we, we've witnessed uh, changes, but but not, not always in the same direction. As I said, for a long time, perfumes were only natural, no discussion. Then the synthetic to such a, a, an important role and proved that they globally could be less costly than the naturals. That temptation for the big fragrance houses was very strong to grow more and more synthetic. They did that in the 70s, in the 80s. And, and at some point, they realized that the consumer, uh, you know, maybe sometimes without knowing why, was refusing this, you know. They were losing market shares. So there's been a trend to go back to more naturals. And what happens now, because of the cost, is that uh, beside the classic, let's call it like that, the classic brands, you know, the, the Lancôme, the, well, name, name the one you want, the, the recent successes in perfumery is what we call the niche perfumery, okay? Smaller companies putting... Let, let, let's say it, putting more money in the bottle, you know, because <laughs> that, would, that would be another uh, long and complicated discussion. But when you honestly look at uh, the price of a bottle of perfume and uh, the cost of the natural ingredients that go inside, uh, you know, the cost is not there. The cost, is, not, the cost is, is much more in uh, Julia Roberts than in, uh, in <laughs> the, the jasmine drop of, of rose oil. <laughs> exactly, that, that and the poor jasmine flower. Um, uh, this, is, this is really fascinating. And I, in fact, want to ask you more about the actual natural ingredients, Dominique. Um, but let me, quick public service announcement before that. So uh, I hope you're all enjoying this chat with Dominique as much as I am. Uh, again, if you've got any questions for Dominique, please put them in the chat window in YouTube, and we'll be sure to get to them in a couple of minutes, in a few minutes. Um, but Dominique, I wanted to ask you uh, sort of like uh, what I think of as like really fast, um, just like fast five, right? Like a couple of quick questions and I just mainly to understand um, what you've referred to in this book um, as uh, such fascinating kind of like natural ingredients. And I want to draw that out without actually uh, giving the, the surprise of the book away. I want people to read the book and enjoy it as much as I did. So let me ask you a couple of questions. So what, according to you, was sort of the craziest, um, craziest ever uh, new natural scent that was ever discovered or that is now like the talk of town, right? And, and you think it's, oh my God, it's crazy because who would have thought that this is this ingredient is is so, I don't know, sought after? Okay. I, I have a candidate. I have a solid candidate for that. I would tell you patchouli. Oh, patchouli. Why? Mm -hmm. Because... Patchouli is known forever. It was yeah. used in Chinese medicine. It was used by the Indians, yep. but always in the form of leaves. They would perfume their shawls and export it to England and all of that. When all of a sudden, the patchouli smell became popular in London and, and some perfumers said, well, why, why don't we try to distill the patchouli leaves? It was a complete revolution because patchouli oil is something truly amazing. It's almost impossible to copy in a synthetic way. It's so complex, so rich. And uh, patchouli has been used, let's say, for 100 years now. And it's still as popular, if not even more popular. And uh, I, I dare say that a majority of perfumes use patchouli one way or the other. So it was some kind of silent revolution because patchouli brings you warmth and cold at the same time. It smells earth, it smells woods, it smells uh, humus. Uh, it's, it's, it's just, perfumers are crazy, all of them, all of them. It's, it's absolutely fascinating, you know. This perfumer loves this, all of that, it prefers this and that. But patchouli, they will all take with them on their dessert island. <laughs> so that's like the the ingredient uh, perfume, or um, you call them the nose, right, Dominic? That yeah, the nose yeah. of the wizard, yeah. That the nose would like uh, sneak into his his uh, his little stash bag. Very fascinating. Um, what is um, what is a scent that um, that that you really like? Wh which one have you? Do you prefer, and do you really really go after? 
Uh, I'm sorry, I'm not going to surprise you. My favorite remains Rose. I think Rose is matchless. It's the absolute beauty. Uh, it's it's the, the damask rose, the one that has been selected to be to be used because it really yields uh, essential oil. Uh, is is such a beauty, always surprising. It is uh, it is of course uh, it has all the feminine uh, attraction, you know, that are attached to this flower, but it has a lot more. Uh, sometimes it has traces of pepper, traces of artichoke. So it's a, it's a fantastic combination. As, as it happens, I, I've spent a lot of time in Turkey and Bulgaria. I've planted rose fields. I have spent a lot of crops work, working with, uh, as I mentioned, with the Roma community pickers. And this is a, a world that is so rich uh, in human relationships, uh, a rose distillery in the months of May, uh, with all the the swallows all around it, and and the sceneries and the running water is just it's just some kind of image of paradise, you know. Let's face it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, totally. And I wish, and I wish that that image was. Um could be placed alongside an actual bottle of perfume that has the rose uh, rose as its prominent ingredient, right? But, but that's not the, the pairing, at least in my head. So uh, it's, it's a, but I'm, I'm so fascinated by what you said about the fields and like the birds and yeah, very, 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 um, yeah, I, I, I would be tempted. Um, what, what about which ingredient is, uh, is the most expensive to, uh, to source? I know. Two, I think of two. Um, agar wood, be long story to explain. I, I, I hope people listening to us know a little bit. It's it's a it's some very uh, dark, uh, intense uh, secretion taken from a, a, a tree from Southeast Asia. Uh, the original agar wood comes from Bangladesh and Assam in in, in India. Uh, a true. It is so rare, the yield is so low that a true high uh, level agar wood oil costs over $50,000 a kilo. Oh, wow. You know? oh, wow. So, so to give you a scale, uh, a kilo of patchouli oil costs $50. Oh. So it's one to 1,000, right? <laughs> Wow. For, for what it's worth, uh, the agar wood story was also so, um, I felt so sad. Well, not sad, I guess, but it was it was such a such a poignant story about how the tree gets hurt. Right. I mean, or whatever you need to you need to make an insertion in the tree. And then it was almost like the tears of the tree is the resin that that's so perfumed. Right. So is, is it did I am I mixing it up or is that agar? No, it's, it's, it's a long, complicated story. The, the, the thing is that uh, for a long time, there were hunters of agar wood going in the white forest and looking for the proper trees because from the outside, if you're not an expert, you cannot see if you will find resin inside the tree or not. Um, so it was wild. And, and then people started to be worried, saying, oh, but we're depleting the resources. Uh, we have to plant new trees and we have to find a way because it's so precious to find a way to be sure that the trees will yield something. So there was a lot of research for years everywhere to do all kinds of chemical treatments to the trees to make them yield something. But nature does not really like that, you know. And, and in general, you, you will realize that it's very difficult to, um, to uh, have a young tree yield something worthwhile. Usually only time does the job. Uh, it's the same for sandalwood, and and it's the same for for for, for many trees. So uh, this is what happened. Now the best oils come from trees that are just um, treated in the most traditional way, which is that people climb on ladders and they plant nails all along the tree, which doesn't kill it. And, and they leave the nails for very long. You know, you take a tree, you do that when it's 25, 30 years old, and you come back 10 or 15 years after that. The nails have almost been swallowed by the growth uh, of, of the wood and the bark. And then, and then the reaction of the tree to the nails is to produce the agar wood. So this, I think, is, is a decent way to, to produce. There's no chemicals involved, not at all. 
Well, it's it, it, not even about the chemical, but I was kind of talking about, I guess I was becoming poetic. Uh, I was talking about the fact that we, um, we tap into the tree and the tree almost sort of, you know, it's crying, right? It's not really crying, but the tree and the resin is, is so fragrant, right? So even in its pain, the tree is releasing something which is so beautiful. And so I was just marveling at, I, and I did not know that that's how agar, um, that's how the raisin gets produced. And that's what was the, the story behind it. And in fact, that one and the sandalwood one made me, made me very, very uh, sentimental. <laughs> I understand. So the, the story you're evoking, I think, is frankincense. Frankincense, okay. yes. Frankincense is probably the most ancient uh, perfume captured by men. Frankincense and cedarwood. Cedarwood, okay. So the frankincense, you're right, uh, is a very small tree. It's, it, it grows on the Horn of Africa. It's very difficult to see. It grows high in altitude in rocks. And, and that's why I'm, I'm telling the whole story in the book. And, and, and yes, there are tappers with a very simple knife who scratch the bark. And it's something, it's one of the most beautiful things I've ever seen in my life. You come to a tree, the, the bark is, is like very soft, almost like velvet. It's, it's a beautiful gray. And, and the guy is very, he knows exactly what he does. So he just does a very light removal uh, of the bark. It doesn't go too deep. And immediately, in a matter of five minutes, you see little milky pearls appear in the wood, which starts to exude uh, what will become the, the, the frankincense, frankincense tears. So you, you can say, oh, this is horrible. We hurt a tree. But no, the tree is OK with that, providing, like always, that you don't do too many scars too, too often uh, and, and, and not too deep. So you have to have very conscious people. But the magic of that is that we know from all the records, you know, frankincense is everywhere in the Bible, in the ancient text. And so, yes, uh, the queen of Sheba, she was, uh, she, 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 was, she was doing that and she was bringing this uh, with, with her camel. She was bringing presents of frankincense to King Solomon, who himself was building his palace full of cedar planks. So the meeting of the amazing smell of the cedar wood from Lebanon with the smell of frankincense from the Horn of Africa, that's what I consider the absolute birth of perfumery in, in, in the story of man. <laughs> and, and, and no sooner than Queen of Sheba, right? Like as far back as that. Fascinating. I, uh, you know, I'm going to look at the clock and I know we have just five minutes to go. So maybe if there are any audience questions, I think this would be a good time for me to pull it up and let me, let me find. Okay. So hi, Helena. And Helena asks, could you share more information about the social and sustainability programs that are being built for the communities that grow natural ingredients? Uh, yes, especially if you have two more hours, I'm, I will be delighted to do that. Uh, no, but seriously, it's it's very, very interesting. As, as I tried to explain, for a long time, nobody cared. Now everybody cares. Everybody cares for good or not so good reasons. Uh, the brands and the companies like, like the FNF, what I call the FNF companies, they want to assure their consumers that they, they are doing the right things. That uh, if they need vanilla and if they're going to use vanilla, uh, the, their supplier uh, in Madagascar is treating uh, the villagers very well. The more you go in depth in poor countries, the more difficult it gets. You know, being sustainable in, in France for lavender or in uh, uh, mint, or our Virginia cedar in, in Texas is, is not so difficult. When you start talking about Haiti, Somaliland, uh, Madagascar, it's another story. So a lot has been done. Let's face it, a lot has been done. Schools, digging wells, dispensaries, uh, a lot. A lot of money has been put. The difficulty and the problem that we, 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 we should remain very, very uh, careful about is that um, a Western mind has a lot of difficulties understanding the reality of how people live in Somaliland, what they expect, what they want, what they do not want. They don't share always our values. So it's tough. 
it's very tough because if you're Estee Lauder or if you're uh, if you're Chanel, I don't want to, it's it's not to point do any finger pointing. Every, everybody is in the same position. Um, you will want to reassure your consumers that the Western standards are, are used at source, and and this is this is very difficult. And 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 when you build a school in Madagascar, uh, okay, you've done one or you've done five or you've done ten, but there's no government, there's nothing. The people are completely abandoned. So, how you know to to what extent, to what point are you going to substitute yourself to what should be the work of a normal state? You know, so this is really it's it it's tough. It's sometimes heartbreaking. But I want to say very clearly that I've seen amazing progress in the mind of these companies that I'm mentioning. Really, yeah, that's fascinating. I. We're almost out of time. Can we sneak one more question in, Dominic? And we can probably really quickly get to it. So Farah says, what was the most surprising discovery for you when writing the book? What was the most challenging part of the writing process? I don't know. The challenging part of the writing process was that I discovered that what, what I just had as in the form of memories in my head, when put in writing, I was getting extremely emotional because it brought back all the memories. And 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 I, I had to keep really concentrating, saying, what will your readers want, want really to read? Do, 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 do they want to hear about you or they want to hear about the pickers? You know? So the book tries to keep a balance in that. And, and that was challenging. It was fascinating. I loved it, but it was challenging. Now, the most surprising discovery... The most surprising discovery for me is to have realized, but it took me a long time. You know, I, I basically I, I've been working 35 years in this, in, in, in this going to these countries and all that, was to realize that everything I was witnessing was just the end of a story that started with uh, before the Queen of Shaba. So, um, and to discover that. Some of these people were fully aware of it, very proud of carrying on with this tradition, and others completely not, completely not. You, I, I'll, I'll let you see in the book because the stories are very different. But the way of, of the history and to realize that perfume was a thread, you know, following the history of mankind was completely overwhelming for me. And, and the truth is that when I was, you know, like in a daily life going and buying and this and that, I, I, I truly realized, came to realize this with writing the book. Wonderful. And and that's such a such an uplifting note to end the conversation on, because I'm almost thinking that, you know, you come, you're, if, if this was like a historical time segment, then, you know, this is perfumes have started so far back. And, and uh, Dominique, you've, uh, you've basically been one of the more recent entrants in the space, even with 35 years of experience, right? So wonderful, wonderful to, uh, to learn all your insights. I am so uh, glad I had this opportunity to read the book. And again, for our audience, this is available in, in any bookstore that you go to. Um, please do get a copy. And I hope you enjoy it as much as I did. Uh, Dominique Roque, thank you for joining us today. Thank you to our audience for your engagement. And thank you for tuning in. Happy smelling, everyone. Good luck, Dominic. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Kavya, and thank you to the audience. Thank you.